we're going to be going through all the post production of Seven Deadly Sense today, probably in like an hour. I, I don't I don't know if I'll go for the full two. There's kind of not a lot to say considering that it's a pretty short film, um, and there's only so much I can kind of show you about the visual effects because don't call it a short film. It's a short film because it is like 12 minutes long, and not a not a 75 minute short film. Like some people think Detroit Evolution is. I'll never let that go. I saw somebody say it on Twitter just the other day. Oh, there's two Read 900 short films. And I said, no, there's one. Respect. <laughs> 12 minutes is a short, though. And Seven Deadly Sins is a short. So there's only kind of so much to talk about. Um, but there is some extensive visual effects work, as you can see with Brian. There's also some sound mixing I want to talk about because sound mixing on this movie was very challenging. There is uh, just the edit itself, the color grading, and also just kind of a look at like what the edit for the movie was before back last summer when I edited it the first time what that was kind of like, how I improved it on a second pass the summer before the version that you saw, and what some of those post-production techniques were. So yes, behind the sense, as Bakasara says in the chat. I'm going to just start with visual effects and get this out of the way so I can close After Effects. And honestly, there's not a whole lot I can kind of like show you about the VFX because I want to use discretion and not accidentally like show you the raw footage of this. Um, I've, I've taken some measures to try and make sure that that doesn't happen even on accident. Um, but yeah, so this is one of the clips. You can see my organizational system uh, on the side here. Well, I guess you kind of can't because uh, let me let me make this display capture kind of small. You can kind of see it on the side underneath my camera here. Um, we've got all sorts of stuff. Also, I want to I want to also say that I did the credits in After Effects, and this is just a template. Um, Wonder titles because it was based on on a Wonder Woman eighty four's trailer. I think it was what is what inspired these this this template. Um, so this was actually pretty easy. It already kind of came like this. What I had control over was the color. So I would be like, all right, Maximilian played bisexual character. I want to pick bisexual colors, um, but these are completely um, controllable. So I think it was like I could I could change this to whatever I wanted. So. You kind of have your different color controls here. And that's how I changed the different colors to match the different flags of the characters uh, that were being played by these various actors. So that's just kind of something, I guess. And then you open up the text and then you can just change whatever your actual text is. This is, again, a template. Like, I, I use templates for all sorts of things like this. I would not know how to make this from scratch. I really don't know how to, like, make a color controller or to you know, make 3D elements or anything like that. Um, I rely on a service called Envato Elements. I pay like $125 a year for it. It has saved my life. It has all these templates. It has stock footage, stock video, stock music, any like music that I use in the background of any videos on YouTube I get from there. I mean, it's, it's, it's invaluable. So uh, yeah, God, I have so much hair and I'm like trying, I'm trying. I'm trying to wrangle it. I'm such a mess. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to take another shot at it. If you have any questions specifically for post-production of Sense, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, there might be something about the post-production process that I have forgotten or neglected to mention so far. But if you can think of anything that you're curious about when you watch the film, from a post-perspective, or even from a production standpoint, I will be happy to answer while I wrangle this, like, three feet of hair that I have grown out in quarantine. I really, I swear, I was going to get my hair cut, like, two weeks before we went to New York for the Detroit Evolution screening. So that was going to be, like, mid-March, and that's exactly when the quarantine hit. Like, quarantine literally started when I was going to get a haircut. So, yes, this is a testament to my commitment to staying inside as this gigantic mane of hair. I have absolutely... <laughs> I've absolutely manifested in the past like eight months. Oh God. Yeah, uh, March, it's gonna be thigh length soon, I swear. I'm also enjoying a pumpkin spice uh, nitro draft latte from La Cologne. This is a really cool company and this is a really nice nitro coffee in a can. Hashtag no spawn. Hashtag no spawn. Also, hollow taco, great nail polish. I've been loving it. <laughs> 
could be Spawn. Probably not. She's selling enough on her own. Hashtag, hashtag queen. <laughs> All right. So away from the credits, back to the actual visual effects. So uh, about this. This required a plugin that I did not have because I was originally under the impression that After Effects could handle 3D objects. Um, that if you took like a 3D object, that, like a 3D model, an OBJ file, and put it in After Effects, you could work with it. This is actually not true. You have to have a, speci a, a specific plugin called Element 3D to be able to manipulate 3D objects in the After Effects program. I'm also using After Effects 2017, if anyone cares. I don't know if newer versions of After Effects have this latently. I haven't heard that that's a thing. I think that you really do need Element to be able to work with it. Element is about a $200 program. I believe I got it on sale for $150, but then I upgraded with the uh, preset texture pack that it comes with and that was like 50 so I, th I think it ended up being about 200 dollars when it was all said and done anyway it is a little pricey however it is cheaper than hiring a visual effects artist to go do the i think it was 35 visual effects shots in seven in seven deadly cents over here i have oh, this is the final shots well i don't know there was there was 10 shots in the opening scene there was one, there was nine shots in the second scene where Brian and Seth are talking to each other on the stage. And then there's 14 shots in the scene from where Brian gets the water from the bartender to the end of the performance. So 10 plus 9 plus 13 is 32. So there's 32 shots of Brian that needed to be doctored in the film. I also cheated on a couple of them. There were a couple of shots that could have needed to be done, but I cropped them. <laughs> and, and we might actually see that uh, in the final cut of, of Sense, the anamorphic cut. Like I, when we get to the editing, when we move over to the premiere, I might show you some of those. Um, but anyway, so this required the 3D object of this helmet. Um, I can... I, I, when I, when Austin first had the idea of putting this helmet on Brian and doing this in 3D, I kind of mentally went through the steps of, all right, well, first of all, I'm going to need a 3D model, and I don't know how to 3D model, so that's a struggle. I'm also going to need the textures. I'm also going to need, you know, the motion tracking. I'm also going to need to make it blend with the environment. There's multiple steps to doing something like this, which are far more complicated than any of the visual effects that I did for Detroit Evolution. Detroit Evolution was mostly those LEDs, which are 2D objects. So I did not have to use Element 3D because they were flat. They laid flat against the head. There was a motion tracker for them. So I didn't have to hand track. I was able to just let it kind of run um, on its own. And also there wasn't any, because those LEDs had their own lighting, they were their own lighting source, I really didn't have to do much to make them blend with the environment or the image that much. Basically all I did was add a little Gaussian blur to make them not look quite so crisp and perfect and uh, like they weren't shot. And also a little bit of film grain to make them blend in with the skin and that was it. With this, you can see there's all this lighting that's happening in the back, in the front, um, and then there's like a blur to it. There's a lot more layers to this object to try to make it as much as possible blend in with actual space. I will tell you, I am not a visual effects artist. I've never been trained in this. I don't know fuck all about what I'm doing. <laughs> the only way that I was able to do this was through downloading the Element 3D plugin and watching some tutorials on how folks did motion tracking for things like Iron Man helmets. There was like a Ghost Rider head replacement tutorial that I watched. Basically head tracking and then the assignment of 3D objects to the head track. That was the sort of basic gist of what I was trying to um, achieve with this with, with, with this effect and um, I was able to follow tutorials that were similar to that. Um, so the tracking, I was able to do that way. The actual, uh, you know, environmental stuff and, and the lighting, I really just winged it. I just played with settings until I felt like I had something that looked decent. <laughs> And, and I bet a visual effects artist who's actually a pro at this would probably look at this and say, oh, you know, she didn't do that great of a job. She, like, missed the opportunity to do some anti-aliasing or some shit. I don't know. Um, and, and they're probably right. <laughs> but, you know, 
I, I worked with what I had, which was nothing. So um, basically, the kind of the things I, I can go through the layers here. So this is a black solid. One of the things I did to make it more immersive was I added shadows. So like that's a shadow underneath the helmet where on his neck and his shoulders it adds a little bit more immersion. Um, this is the layer of the microphone because if that wasn't on top, then the uh, then the helmet would be when he turns his head, you can see that the helmet kind of clips in over the microphone, which is not supposed to happen because of course I've put this helmet on top of the footage. So I have to sandwich uh, the helmet in between the footage so that any object that the helmet is behind ends up behind that object in, in the final version. And then we've also got this, which is the actual helmet. Now, um, this down here is the, uh, the texture that's on his actual face. And there's a reason why I have to put that under everything else, and I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, if I go to helmet here, we open up all of the different effects uh, in this effects panel. And I will, I'll move my camera here so you can see this fully. I might actually chill over here for... All right, we should be back. My OBS froze. Uh, I swear to God. I forgot just, like, just, the Lord is testing me. I went and got my LAN connection at least. So now at least the internet won't bork. Um, my, I, all I was doing was trying to move my video to the side so that I could show you this effects panel. Uh, okay. Um, all right, let's move this so you can see it. So this is the effects panel. I'm gonna unplug this and plug this back in so that my camera might come back eventually, whatever. But while I'm waiting for my camera to come back, I can show you up in the upper left all of the different effects that are layered on the Element 3D helmet element. All right, so first of all is the element effect, which is the actual helmet. Uh, what's weird is that you have to open this as a solid. You just have to like create a new solid, add the element effect to it, and then that's where you choose your actual 3D object. It's not like you take the 3D object and drag and drop it into the sequence. That's kind of how I thought it was going to go. That's what's intuitive to me. I thought it would be an object, a layer down here on top of everything else, but it is actually an effect on a layer. Weird. So we've also got spotlight. This, uh, you can see, I'm, tog I'm toggling this on and off. You can see on the upper side here of his helmet, it's toggling some lighting on and off. It's very subtle, but it adds a nice little colored fog to the side that I think is more immersive. Then you have noise. This is gonna be really difficult for you guys to see on your end, but it does make a difference. Uh, let me see if I can maybe zoom in really close. Yeah, that's still pretty hard to tell. It's a really, really subtle effect. Might not even be doing anything on this shot, actually. And then you have your blur, which is a less subtle effect. Because you can see without the blur, it's too sharp, right? It looks like it's a visual effect. It looks like it's a, a, a fake object. It's too sharp. It's too sharp around the edges. It just looks like it came out of a 3D rendering software. So you add a little Gaussian blur to make it look like it was actually the same focal length as everything else that's facing the camera. There is in fact noise, great. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not seeing any change, but, but maybe it's different. So if we actually go to the element uh, effect here, which controls all elements uh, of the actual helmet, uh, you have all the different 
uh, effects you can do. And so this is where we create the group null, which is down here, which is how we end up tracking it to his face. So this is why that's important. But the actual controls of, of how it looks are under render settings. And oh man, we got all sorts of stuff. We got physical environment, lighting, shadows, ambient occlusion, reflections, fog, motion blur, depth of field, glow. And I used very many of these. So physical environment, this is a really cool effect. The override layer here is 3.7. That is the actual raw footage. If I hit none, then there's no like texture put on the actual object. This is what's showing what's what your reflections are for your object. Because I picked the footage, this kind of automatically like fills in and mimics the lighting conditions of the footage that he is in, which can get a little gross sometimes because if you're doing like a full on chrome reflective face, you can kind of see like, like this, this shadow here of this person standing in the front, like this blob would like be in the shadow, which doesn't make any sense because that's not what's facing him. It should be this guy's face that's facing him. So sometimes if, if you're really having a reflective surface, it doesn't work because it's too reflective and, and you're just copying the footage too obviously. But with something like this, where we're just kind of mimicking the edges here, we're just trying to get the same kind of like lighting conditions. And because Seven Deadly Sins has such obvious lighting uh, in, in the bisexual sort of colors, this worked really well. And this was kind of my silver bullet for trying to mimic the lighting conditions for everything with Brian because... Um, it was just, it, it was the, the first thing I did that, that started to make it look like he was actually in the environment. I could also add a little bit of tint here, uh, which could be any color. I could change that to any color. And this kind of, as you can see, when I, when I really crank it up to something obvious like that, gave it a little bit of a, a lining, you know, it kind of lined it with a certain, a, sh a certain shade. I picked a very like muted gray blue here. Um, and if I hadn't done anything, if I just done white, then, uh, then it would have been too bright again. So, and if I had just done black, then you would have ended up like that and it would have been too dark. So I kind of went halfway between it added its own luminosity, but it doesn't look so bright that it looks out of place. We also have exposure and gamma. This controls the brightness of the actual object. Um, I played around with that a few times. Playing with the gamma was kind of fun because on some shots, it really makes it look like it's like very glowy and very techno, but you do that too much and it kind of looks like a cartoon. So I, I had to be a little bit um, discerning when it came to that. Now we've also got use comp lights. This is like other lighting stuff. This is a very subtle effect. I didn't really use much of that. I don't think I used anything with the shadows. Um, I used subsurface. I did enable subsurface scattering, but it doesn't really seem to do anything. Ambient occlusion, I sometimes used. Uh, this is sort of, it's kind of hard to explain from my point of view as somebody who isn't really in visual effects. I'm sure if you Google it, it'll give you a better answer than what I'm about to give you. But ambient occlusion is kind of, as you can see, and this is a blue light, I could change the color um, when I toggle this on and off. It is that kind of like self glow, that self luminosity that you can toggle on and off. And if I turn, like if I turn this white and made that as bright as I could, it really illuminates what parts of the image it is impacting. And in this case, it was those edges. I really want to go back to, <laughs> I want to go back to blue. Let's go back to blue. Sometimes I didn't use this, but with the really bright shots that were on the stage, it seemed to work pretty well. Fog was very, very useful. Fog added that haze because he's actually standing in fog on the stage. So, um, you know, that, that, that really added like a haze, a blur, made it blend in a lot better. It's not supposed to be sharp. It's kind of an ethereal fog to it. Again, I could change the color of this to whatever I wanted. So like I could have made the, the, the fog a bright red. And you can see that's the impact that it has on it. It's like a colored haze that sits over the image. 
And I went with a dark blue because it was, again, it's a pretty subtle effect. Uh, motion blur, I, I definitely used, but I'm not sure how much of an impact it had. I was trying to use that to make the movement of his head look more natural. Um, but I'm not sure that actually made an impact. I think that the, the most natural way of achieving movement of the head is to just keyframe more, just to track it more and more. And then you've also got glow, and I use that a lot too. I love using glow. It made a pretty big difference on most of my shots. It looks like we've frozen After Effects. Can I get, can I toggle things on and off? Nope, nothing's toggling on and off. Cause I didn't render this shot in advance. There we go. Okay, so I can toggle on and off the glow. So you can see that makes a huge difference. This makes it look kind of fake and like it's just a 3D model, but you add that glow and it really makes it look techno-y and daft punk and like it belongs in the environment. So all of those uh, effects combined really came together to make this look proper because if I you know, removed any of them, it wouldn't have made too big of a difference, but if I removed all of them, then this would have looked really completely fake. Again, also if I had removed like all of the peripheral effects as well, these also made a pretty big difference. So I'm gonna turn my video back on or try. There I am, I'm back. Okay, so the other thing about this visual effect is not just making it blend with the environment, um, but also, okay, so there's two more things. I want to show you how I got his face to work, how I was able to change what appeared on his actual helmet, and I want to show you tracking. So tracking is pretty straightforward. Um, I think, actually, yeah, I, I tracked on the null. That's right. This was, this tracked differently than um, things tracked in... Detroit Evolution. In Detroit Evolution, I would I would basically take the footage and right click and be like uh, track motion, which is here, and it would allow me to create a little box and I would go like play track motion. It would track the motion for me. It would create a whole like separate object and I'd have all these little keyframes and motion trackers and I would be able to apply any object to the motion track and make it move with the image. That just did not work with this. Partially because it was a 3D object and also partially because it was just a whole face. And I was trying to use auto motion tracking multiple times and it was just not working. So I had to pretty much do it manually, which meant creating this null object now this is what controls the actual positioning and everything of the helmet. Um, I know that on this shot, I didn't have to do a lot of tracking, but I think on this shot, I definitely did. Yeah, so you can see the different keyframes, all the different position, the XY rotation, all of these different controls and dots are different shifts that I had to make uh, as I was playing with the object and trying to make it track to the head. And this one also has a little bit of a different layer as well. I have this magenta solid, which adds a purple glow underneath. And sometimes I try to do that because his helmet is currently purple. So I tried to give uh, there a, a little bit of colored shadow as well to show that the lighting from the actual helmet was reflecting on his actual face. So now I want to show you actually how um, I take these elements and control what appears on the actual helmet. In this case, it was a thumbs up. And I showed you guys earlier that I keep those layers underneath everything. Now this was just an MOV that I downloaded off of Envato Elements. Again, Envato Elements, they saved my life. Uh, this is just some stock footage, a stock graphic that was made. I looked it up, I downloaded it, and I plopped it down here into After Effects and we went with it. Now here up in Element again, um, hopefully, please don't freeze OBS, okay. <laughs> please God. All right, so up in Scene Setup, this is gonna open up a whole new window that I'm gonna have to move over to my other display. Come on. Oh my God, oh my God, lag, oh my God. <laughs> All right. So this is Element 3D 
the actual interface. This is where you can control what your object looks like and everything. So I'm moving it around. Okay, so yeah, you can see what it actually looks like. Um, I didn't mention where I got this from, this model. I got this model from a place called CG Trader. It is an online emporium for cheap OBJs and other 3D objects. Most of them compatible with Element 3D and After Effects because I think any OBJ can be imported into this plugin. So um, I downloaded like four or five different helmets. I think they were like five bucks a piece. I probably sunk like $30, $35 into experimenting with this. This one was the one that worked the most. It just fit the best in the back and covered the face the best in the front. And it had the most easily customizable face. Now to customize the face, um, we've got all these different textures here, which control different parts of the helmet. And I've got all these different textures here. I told you that I bought a preset pack when I bought Element 3D. And they all come with, and it came with all these different textures, these materials. Pro Shaders, that's the name of the plugin down here. Um, you've got concrete, plastic, metal, brick, just basic stuff that you might need to use. And so if I decided to make whatever texture this is into stone, okay, you can see that that was the texture for this doohickey here. This little part. And what about this? I don't know what part this is, but if I made that into uh, denim. <laughs> what, what did I just make into denim? Ooh, I don't know. I can't find it. There's like no... Ah, that's denim. There we go. That's a little earpiece part. So this is really customizable. I mean, I could add a different, you know, texture to all the different parts of the helmet and really get custom with the different textures and the different materials that this object is made out of, which is really what I wanted. I wanted that custom ability. Although you can see that I just put black gloss on everything because it was the easiest thing to blend with the environment. If I went with something black and if I went with something slightly shiny, it seems like that was the easiest thing to just say, all right, blend into the environment. But yes, imagine, imagine a whole Brian helmet made out of denim. Wouldn't that be something? So I just went with the black gloss with the exception of the face. Now, you know that this is the face because if you put a different texture on it, that that happens. <laughs> so it's a whole a whole brick face. But what I did was I put uh, a custom, as you can see, custom layer. And right here, I was able to choose the layer at the very bottom of the sequence. And that's how I ended up with this video. So if this, I don't actually remember quite how I did this, but I know that that's basically the gist, is that because I imported this in the sequence, put it under all the footage, but it was in there, I was able to pull it into this program as a custom layer. And I could control the various, you know, aspects of it. I can control like the centering of it. I could control um, how bright it was and, uh, how how contrasty it was. I could make it black and white. I mean, there's a lot of different things, but like, let's say I'm, I did make it black and white. Let's turn down the brightness some, turn down the saturation. Just like make it really, really grim looking. And if we hit okay, then that just changed it. You just saw that happen before your eyes. I changed it right there. And this just propagates through the whole scene, which is really useful because there's no keyframing of the actual stuff on his face. It's just you change the object and it all falls into place. So working with his face was actually pretty easy. All I had to do was just decide what I wanted his helmet to actually say at any given time and then I would look up a video or a stock video or a graphic or something that would kind of get that point across and I would just import it and assign that to be the texture that was on the front of his helmet. So that was one of the easier parts of doing this visual effect. Um, the tracking was by far the hardest. I had to do so much hand tracking 
Uh, there were some shots in this film that took four hours just to do like a 10 second shot because the tracking, I had to go just frame by frame. There was no way around it because I was tracking both his head and the camera movements. So luckily, Jonathan Strayton shot the majority of this movie on a tripod and I didn't have to do too much camera movement, but I still had to do enough to where it was a chore. Um, I think that's everything pretty much for this visual effect. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer them. Uh, just feel free to throw them in the chat. Meanwhile, I will now go over to Adobe Premiere and talk about the actual editing. What do we have in Premiere? So there's a couple different cuts of this movie. You are looking at New Picture Lock, which is the final form that you saw on YouTube. So this is the, the version of the movie that you guys are familiar with. Um, it has this scene with the bartender here. Uh, obviously it has all of Brian's new helmet stuff. Uh, it has a new credit sequence that you're familiar with. And it has all Austin's new music. This is the final cut. Um, just, you know, you can kind of look at it here. It is you know, about 13 minutes long. 13 minutes long. And that that's all the cuts and layers that it is. So that's... I, I always enjoy seeing the string outs, the actual timeline sequences of some of my favorite films. Just to give an impression of how much actually went into them. Honestly, this is pretty simple. This is pretty straightforward, not that intimidating. If you look at something like Game of Thrones, it is just absolutely wild, usually because of the sound mixing. They'll have like 10 different layers of sound. And I, I like, I don't even know. I'm so bad at sound mixing. So I, like I put ambient noise, music, sound effects, dialogue, done. Four layers, that's all I need. Prolonged whipped cream. <laughs> so, um, as you know, if you've watched previous editing streams of mine, how I work is I'll do a string out of all of the footage. I will sync uh, the different audio sources to the footage. Purple is TRA. I think that Graham is red, and I think Maximilian's green. I think that's how I did it. And then uh, Michael Smallwood is yellow. Brian was blue. So, uh, and then this dark blue is camera audio. That's what we're actually syncing it to. So this makes it look like we had, um, I mean, when you take all the spaces out, probably about an hour and a half hour of raw footage for since. That's it. Uh, that's really not a lot. We had about the same amount for On the Road Again. This was a 17 minute movie initially. On the Road Again is two and a half. <laughs> You know, sometimes it, it but, but both were shot over the course of a day. So if you have a lot of takes and, you know, you spend a lot of time shooting and if you have a lot of takes of like long conversations, which is what ended up happening with On the Road Again, On the Road Again has an opening conversation scene that's a minute and a half long. And they did, I swear to God, 17 takes of that opening scene. So that's why we have an hour of footage of it versus something like this where you have a lot of scenes such as this one where you have five or six takes for the whole I mean this is this is a pickup this isn't even really a full take actually I'm gonna I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to this scene this scene at the bar I don't even think these pieces so we had two pickups of red beard but we had three takes three takes of this whole scene we did two wides and then we did one so everything you see from this angle in the final film of seven deadly Sense was from one take the reason we did this in so few takes is because we were 10 minutes over our time at that location and the location owner was staring at us <laughs> and i was just like okay one more take one more take we're almost done we're almost done we got to get out of here bye so yeah we were we were rushing we were trying to get out of there as fast as we could luckily tra and grim nailed their footage on the first time but because we were only able to get front facing footage for this uh this scene i felt like it was a little limited because we by this time all the extras had gone home i sent them home it was 9 p.m they were the only people in the whole bar we were shooting this and uh, this is like the opening scene in the film in the bar. And I really wanted you to be able to see that we did actually get like 25 extras out there to make that bar look lived in. And then later, it turns out I deleted this scene. 
I deleted this scene from the film um, for a variety of reasons. You can go to YouTube and look at the um, deleted scene to, to see my justification for that. But we did have footage that was facing outward into the bar where their backs were turned to the camera. And look, you see all these extras. And anybody who's watched since enough times knows that I included this in the opening scene. This is really some editing trickery because, as you know now, this shot was not meant for that scene that made it into the film. But I was able to sync Tiara's lip sync and her body movements to the dialogue that she's saying in this scene close enough to where when you actually uh, meet them for the first time, it kind of works. Oh, I don't want to solo the music. All right. Let's turn up this so you can actually hear the audio. We'll get a new band going. What? Okay, you've got like 15 cents taking up our dead. Surely that's enough to go solo. I not bad, considering that that was not at all what she was saying. <laughs> yeah, location owner was, was breathing down our neck. Very nice guy, but he'd been there for 12 hours, and I don't blame him, and we ran out of time. Todd Howard. It just works. I was trying to think of his name the other day. I was like, Todd, 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 what's his last name? Todd. I think I, th I was thinking his name was Tom, so I didn't even get the first name right. Todd Howard. What a man. Show them the, the fake Brandy Alexander. Oh, I will be showing them the fake Brandy Alexander. I will get to that, Austin. Uh, I will get to that when I show the previous cut of sense. There was also, that was, but that was an example of my other editing trickery. I will tell you this, the first time I edited this film, last summer, I was in absolute despair because an hour for a 12 minute, an hour of raw footage for a 12 minute film, this ain't a lot y'all. Like I had 10 and a half hours to work with for Detroit Evolution and that's only like five times longer. So only having an hour of raw footage for a film of this length was really rough. Now, I will say the Seven Deadly Sins montage in the middle is like three minutes long and we didn't have to shoot any of that. That's all stock footage and stuff we shot later. So there is a pretty significant part of the running time that didn't get shot that day um, or at the very least wasn't shot at the club. So even if you say nine minutes of footage that we were shooting, an hour isn't much. I barely had any footage to work with. I was trying to really make the best of things. So... Um, in my original cut, final cut anamorphic, I think is what that's called. Yeah, this is, I've, I've already queued it up. We didn't have the scene with the bartender. We didn't have the whipped cream scene. And the reason for that is I felt like it wasn't adding anything to the main log line of the Brian and Seth story. Because the log line is a, a bisexual musician... Uh, goes to the club and finds out that his rival ex-bandmate has come into the possession of the Seven Deadly Synthesizers. Uh, it's about their rivalry. It's about this legend. It's about their dynamic. Uh, and I love Mag and, and Jared and the side... Jesus Christ, UPS! <laughs> that was a firework, I think. Was it? Was it? Or did they just drop a package on our door? <laughs> <laughs> Firework or UPS? I think that was a bomb. Go check. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? <laughs> oh my god. It's like October 17th. Why are people watching fireworks? In the middle of the day. In the day. middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing else there. What was that? Someone just ran face first into the dark. Yeah, y'all thought it was at y'all's house, man. Yo, okay, anyway. So, as I was saying, so we cut the bartender scene. It just really, like, it didn't fit with the main plot line. It's about, it's about Jared and, like, what he does. It's the bartender. It's, like, side funny stuff. It's, like, a whole minute that's just there for f being funny. It works in the YouTube cut. You guys really glommed onto it. Love the whipped cream noises joke. 
However, in a festival cut, when you're applying to film festivals, you want to make your film A, as short as possible, and B, as lean as possible. You don't want anything in that movie to make it, you, like, you do not want them to get bored for a single second. You, you are competing with some of the best filmmakers in the world. You want to be able to say, there's nothing wrong with my movie. Like, you would not take points off my movie for any reason. So I cut it for the festival cut. But in order to do that, I had to consolidate a few of the scenes that were already filmed in order to like because there's obviously there's like stuff that happens in that scene for continuity reasons that kind of needed to be worked with because the bartender brings them their drinks but this is the original cut of the scene where Seth comes back from talking to Brian he sits down and then we go all the way to water for brain Oh, and you'll also get to see the uh, original stock temp track music that was here before Austin actually provided a score and the god-awful sound mixing and what this movie used to sound like before I fixed it. Did you see a ghost? Something like that. Like a really smug... Hold on, guys. I'm trying to get this to play without being laggy. Something like that. Like a really smug ghost with a really nice synthesizer. Do you think his synthesizer is also haunted? Wait. Is that... Ryan? So, you can see, we totally skipped the interaction with the bartender, and you'd never know. The problem is, though, before... Uh, there was no drinks on the table because when Seth sits down, there's a drink here because this was actually, this footage was actually pulled from when he comes back from seeing the Brian performance. So this was pulled from a completely separate scene. That's why there's already a drink here. And that's why her, have you seen a ghost is off screen because that's not what she says. He sits down and says he has it. Like that's the actual piece of footage that this is. But I cut it before anybody says anything and then have her introduce, have you seen a ghost off screen? And then we transition in a scene that way. But there's this shot here that was before the bartender came. Do you think his synthesizer is also haunted? This made it into the film. But the problem is that was shot before they had their drinks. So I had to VFX their drinks onto the table here. And without this, eh, come on. Yeah, so this is the original footage. I digitally added the Brandy, the Brandy Alexander and I digitally added the IPA. And it works. Do you think his synthesizer is also haunted? The reason this works is because, uh, again, thank God, Jonathan Strayton shot on a tripod, no camera movement, didn't have to do motion tracking, was able to do this straight up in Premiere. I was also able to take footage from later where you have a similar angle where you can see the drinks and then I just basically rotoscope them out so like if you take away this actual footage and see what they look like i think i just did this through masking so that's that's the brandy alexander what does this mask look like oh wait hold on there we go oh wow that's a lot of that's a lot of points but yeah, so I just masked it. And if I got rid of this mask, then you'd see the whole piece of footage that was here. Nothing to it but to do it. But of course, I ended up having to cut that lovely uh, visual effect because when I added the bartender scene back into the film, uh, I didn't need it anymore <laughs> because they didn't, because the bartender was going to actually bring them their drinks. Can we please jump around? I believe that shot is here. Yeah. This is the same shot. I think it's a little bit wider. Although I might have... 
crop this? Is this a crop? That's definitely a crop. Yeah. <laughs> it was also way more cropped in the original version as well. It's 4K, so you can do that without losing resolution if you're outputting in 1080p. This is pretty useful. Um, what else is there about this original cut? I mean, you could tell, again, that um, the sound wasn't super great. I ended up having to... I, what, I, what I did with this is I would take the original scene with its original sound and use it as a reference... But then I rebuilt everything from scratch. And sometimes I made different choices. And one of the ones that I know is kind of interesting in regards to choices of editing. Oh, that's, this is pride. Okay. I think this is it. Is the finger counting. So... Editing for comedy is an interesting thing because so much of Seven Deadly Sins is visual comedy. It is comedy that requires a good edit or a good camera angle or a good you know timing of the edit to work. And I always felt like in this original cut, the actual joke here the counting on the fingers of the seven delay sense just didn't work like it just didn't land and i thought that maybe like the joke just didn't work um and this is this is why and this is what it originally looked like did that was all just generic recycled garbage oh you said there were seven so we kind of rush into that. He ends his line. Jared immediately starts counting. We have a little bit of Seth looking confused. And then we finish up. It was a pretty straightforward edit of this joke. Um, it's pretty much edited the way we shot it. And I just threw it together. And I thought, oh, well, like that's reasonably funny or whatever. But I, it never got laughs in a crowd uh, whenever we screened it you know, festivals or whatever. And then when I was re-editing it for the new cut, I discovered a much, much funnier way of editing that scene. And that, if you remember, was like this. He played it. I got so damn jealous. I mean, he did just play pretty good. No, all of that shit was just presets, just generic recycled garbage. That is way funnier. <laughs> and the reason is because, first of all, we let there be a little bit of a little pause, a little beat after Seth's dialogue. But what I really find hysterical about this moment is that hand coming up just in the foreground, starting to count. And all of the eye lines go straight to it. And then we reveal that Jared is counting the seven deadly sins on his fingers. This joke works way better with a reveal like that. And also with a little bit of pause after the dialogue to let that joke breathe and start on its own merit. Um, and also we, we, we linger on Jared instead of cutting back to Seth and then we go back into it. So yeah, um, that's, that's just one of those other little editing things that ended up improving in the, in the second pass, uh, for the version that y'all saw, because I found a way to visually make that joke much, much more effective. Ah, oh, thank you back for seven months. Bit of tragedy M with your subscription and Lauren James for following as well. Six minutes ago. Woohoo, thank you, welcome. Honestly, I told you this was going to be a pretty short stream. Um, I don't know if there's really anything else to talk about. Um, like I said, the sound mixing was kind of a mess. Um, you've probably been able to tell that a little bit in between the two different versions I've been sharing with you. I guess there's also color grading. That can be maybe the last thing that I talk about. Um, so the raw footage as shot looked like that it was very red that's what came out of the camera 
which is ironically also called a red, but that's not why it's red. It was red because that was just the color temperature of how we shot. Um, I made the color much more blue and purple to match uh, the environment of some of the other shots and also because that's more of what I wanted to go by. And under this panel here in the color grading, you have all this red metadata. And the red is, is I, I never want to shoot on anything but red footage ever again, honestly, because the, the color leniency is so much better than shooting on anything else. I can really push, I can push my reds up. I can, you know, isolate my blues and push that up. I can, you know, isolate my purples and push that up or my greens. Uh, purple would be opposite of green, it's in the other direction. And it affects just certain parts of the screen instead of everything. Um, same down here, I mean, you know, gamma, gamma just of red. Or gamma just of blue, you know. You can, you, you just have so much power. And so I just did that. And I, I went for, of course, the bisexual lighting palette. I went with purples and blues and just tried to match that vibe. And tried to make the skin tones look good too. I think that was a little too bright. I also did that a little bit with some of Brian's footage, I should say. Um, this is the final cut, so I think I can, I think I have this. I guess I didn't do it here. I think I definitely did it here. Maybe I didn't. Well, I could have sworn that I threw some effects on here. But no, I guess I guess I just I whatever whatever came out of the camera, so to speak, in After Effects, I just went with it. I thought sometimes I also added like more lumetri color grading effects and stuff to make the helmet shots blend in more, but I guess I didn't. <laughs> Michelle saw the footage and said, "Okay, but more by." See, all y'all like to compliment the lighting in my stuff, and it is beautiful. Uh, John and and Aaron and. Uh, Brett all have done a great job. However, I do also want to give credence to the fact that a lot of it is color grading. A lot of it is um, trying to get those colors and stuff to work actually in post-production in the editing suite as much as when they come out of the camera. I mean, again, as shot... Is this as shot, actually? This might actually just be as shot. I don't know. Is this not color graded? What's happening? <laughs> like there's there's no way that's as shot yeah so this is this is as shot and then i made it more blue and purple this might have actually been this might have actually been not color graded why didn't i color grade this shot <laughs> that's funny but this actually achieved that bisexual lighting naturally, I suppose, if, I, if, if this isn't color graded for whatever reason. I wonder if I didn't color grade it just because it's the deleted scene and I, <laughs> and I forgot. That looks like that's graded. I don't know. I feel like my After Effects is messing up because there's no way There's no way that that came out of the camera looking that contrasty. <laughs> Writer, director, editor, author, VFX, artist, lighting god, and very confused person leading a stream that's half-baked. Oh, uh, yeah. So if you do have any questions about sense, feel free to drop them in the chat. I don't know if I've seen any. Um, but, you know, if, if there's any that I missed, go ahead and let me know. Um, if there's anything else, I'm about to wrap up the stream, I think, just because I don't really have anything else to share. I just gave you a little bit of a look at the behind the scenes of the VFX and how I ended up doing that, how Brian's helmet works and After Effects, a little bit about the color, a little bit about some of the editing trickery that I did in Sense because there was so, so much about this movie that had to be fixed in post or had to be finangled um, in, order to, in order to work. We need to split up for clues. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any other major... I don't think there's any other major edits. I think this is pretty much... This was the big one. Oh, this is the final cut. This was the big one. That that The, the counting scene was like the, the big edit that I changed. Um, and then obviously I added this deleted scene back, which is its whole, whole other thing. 
take 50 minutes of extra whipped cream. I feel like people have already done that. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything for today. Uh, not a whole lot to talk about with Sense post-production. That's what we get for it being a short and relatively straightforward. Um, but yeah, this is, this is probably going to be my last Saturday stream of the year. Uh, these next two weeks I am busy working with Whaley's wedding, which is going to be a lot of fun. Also, I'm trying to finish up On the Road Again. Uh, On the Road Again trailer is coming out this Monday on Oplu, so you get the first visual look at that as well as a release date for Patreon if you want to get a look at On the Road Again early access pictures. Those have already been posted on Patreon for a dollar, and all one dollar and up patrons get access to On the Road Again, so no matter what level you are, you'll get to see it by the end of the month. Um, we've also got the continuation of Call of Cthulhu, the game on Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern, and then on Friday I'll be playing another spoopy game of the week. Not sure what it's going to be yet. I will get back to you on Apu on Monday and we'll announce that. But next Saturday I will not be streaming and I will probably not be streaming Saturdays for the indefinite future. I'm going on a bit of a Saturday hiatus. Um, we will, I, I will say there will be at least one Saturday stream in November. Um, more information on what that's going to be and what that is going to be about in a couple of weeks. I'll be ready to announce that, but there will be one more Saturday stream, um, before the end of the year. It's just, it's going to be different. It's not going to be like a, like a two hour, like technical noon stream, like, um, they typically are. Um, it's going to be something, it's, it's going to be like a one-off event sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, I don't know when they'll end up coming back. I think it's just one of those things of like, I'm kind of going to have to be in a position where I have new content or I have a new movie I'm working on or something like that, which I, I think will happen, um, in early 2021. So it'll probably only be a few months. I would, I would suspect that the Saturday streams will return in the spring, um, it's, this isn't forever. It's just a hiatus, but for now I figure I can save, um, save a little bit of energy, save a little bit of weekends and, uh, take a little break from doing the Saturday streams just because I don't really have a lot left to share in regards to film stuff because I've gone through since I've gone through, um, Detroit Evolution. I will be going through on the road again more next year when it goes public. There's also not a whole lot to go through with on the road again. Um, I can maybe do, maybe do that early next year if I get bored, <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. So long farewell. We hate to say goodbye. Well, there's still three streams a week. You still see me three times a week. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, I will see you Monday with Apu. Thank you for joining me today. As always, stay great, hydrate, have a happy time zone, and go vote for Iggy. On behalf of Iggy, if you are American, 18 up, hashtag vote for Iggy. Post your pledge today, and I will send you a lovely Iggy I voted sticker. Look how great they are. Yes. No, that's too early. There's going to be lines. I'm going to vote on Tuesday. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>